right, so chapter eight. We are moving right on along here. Just think, we're like a third of the way through with the class already. Pretty, pretty amazing when you think of it. Chapter eight, basic contract law. Do um, you want slides? Gosh, you're so I demanding. So needy people are. You created these monsters by giving them to them. I don't know what. They help, don't they? Oh, yeah. yeah. They <laughs> I like the little three slide per page printout where you have room for the notes on there. It makes yeah. a huge difference. I think it just gives you a way to keep your notes organized. Because otherwise, you just have a big notebook with 40,000, you know, little random things jotted. Yeah, you don't have to match your notes up with the slides. <laughs> right. sort of, you know, I've told students in the past, when you get to the end and you start to study, you just study these because if it, if it wasn't important enough to warrant getting included in the slides and in the discussion, probably not all that important for the exam. It's not meant for this chapter. <coughs> all right, so... Let's try this again since you got the slides again. Basic contract law. First of all, we need to talk about what is a contract. You know, what, what is this thing that we use so often? A contract is a legally enforceable promise or set of promises between legally competent parties supported by legal consideration. A lot of legal stuff going on here, right? Uh, to do or refrain from doing something um, for which the law provides a remedy if a breach of, of the promise occurs. So it's basically an agreement that will be enforced in a court of law where two parties have agreed they're going to do something for one another. And if they don't, there's going to be some penalty for not doing that. That's a contract. Okay? We, and we'll talk about what some of the requirements are for that right now. The first is that they be voluntary. You can't be forced into a contract. It must be voluntary. We need an agreement or a promise. That promise must be between legally competent parties and supported by legal consideration, which is just money that's promised to be exchanged, and about a legal act. And we're going to dive into some of these and, and, and elaborate on them a little bit more. We want to talk about the difference between an express contract and an implied contract. Express contracts are ones where the terms have been clearly laid out. Most often, they are, what do you think? Written. written. The best example of an express contract is a written contract. We can, however, have express oral agreements. For example, oral buyer agency is an express agreement. And the reason for that is we've actually had a discussion with that buyer about us representing. If you remember back earlier tonight when Tracy was up here and we were doing the role play and she said she wasn't interested in the property and I asked if I could send her some other properties and maybe if she saw something that she was interested in, I'd be happy to show it to her. You see how we're expressing the terms of that agreement? Does that make sense for everybody? That's an express oral agreement. And, and there are certain agreements that can be oral. Leases, for example. In North Carolina, most leases can be oral in nature. You don't have to have a written contract for a lease to be enforceable in North Carolina. And then certain contracts must be in writing. So express can mean either written or oral. Implied means the, the terms of the contract were never stated. They never stated in writing. They're never stated orally. They're not stated at all. It's just you've acted like you've been, you're going to be bound, so you are bound. The classic example doesn't work anymore. The classic example shows you how long ago I got my real estate license. This is how they taught me implied contracts. When you pull up to a gas pump and you pump the gas, you're expected to do what? Right. Go inside and pay for it. Don't work like that no more. Right? <laughs> they don't let you pump any gas before you pay anymore. So now the example I use is a restaurant. When you go to a restaurant, and I'm not talking about Hardee's, I'm talking about a sit-down restaurant with wait staff, and you order dinner, does anybody say to you, you know, Jim, you understand if you order this rack of lamb that you're going to have to pay $28.99 plus tax and gratuity, 
you know, before you can leave here tonight. I, I don't know of a restaurant that does that, right? Mm -hmm. It's just understood that if you order the food and you eat the food, you do what? You pay for the food. And if you don't believe that's an enforceable and legal contract, get up and walk out and see what happens. I guarantee you somebody will come along to enforce that contract on you. So we can have these implied contracts, but that doesn't mean they're a good idea, and they're particularly not a good idea in real estate. Okay? We never want to have contracts created out of implied actions. We always want to have express contracts, and particularly we want to have what kind of express contracts? Written. Written express contracts. Absolutely. Absolutely. We also want to make sure you understand the difference between a bilateral contract and a unilateral contract. How many wheels does a bicycle have? Two. How many wheels does a unicycle have? One. Believe it or not, I have somebody in my neighborhood who rides a unicycle every day now, and it trips me out every single I cannot, I'm like the kid. I can't get up. I'm like, there he goes. You know, I just have to stop what I'm, what I'm doing and watch the guy go by on the unicycle. It is the craziest thing. It's like my own little personal circus, and he goes by. I can be in the front yard, I'm just staring at the guy. Like, you're walking down the street. You would, think, yeah, exactly. you would think I would get over it after a while, but it's like the first time every time he goes by. Well, bilateral contracts have two of something, and unilateral contracts only have one of something. And it's not parties, it's promises. A bilateral contract has two promises. Two parties have each promised to do something. So think of a real estate contract, for example. The buyer has promised to do what? To buy it, right? Pay money. The buyer has promised to pay money. What does the seller promise to do? So. Sell the house, transfer title, right? So both parties have promised to do something. A promise for a promise, two promises, that's a bilateral contract. A unilateral contract is one where only one party has promised to do something. The other party has not promised, but the, but the first party, the one that did promise, is hoping the other party will. So in a real estate transaction, what's the most common example, do you think, of a unilateral contract where one, only one party has promised to do something? Or offer to purchase. An offer to purchase is a unilateral contract. Because the buyer has promised to pay money, right? Mm -hmm. But the seller hasn't promised to sell the property. Does that make sense? If the seller signs and accepts, then we have a bilateral contract. Absolutely. An offer to purchase is always a unilateral contract. An accepted offer to purchase is a bilateral contract. And then finally here, the difference between an executed contract and an executory contract. And this is one that even attorneys get wrong all the time. Lenders are notorious for getting this one wrong, and I don't want you to get it wrong on a test. You put your client under contract, and Tamara's laughing at me back there. You put your client under contract, and you contact the lender, you say you're under contract, and this is the email you get back from the lender. Send me a copy of the fully executed contract. What does executed mean? Done. Done. Dead. Yeah. Over with. Done. So in contract terminology, that means what? They've already closed. They've closed. Everything's finished. So would that be an accurate word to use in that situation when we just went under contract? No. The word we're looking for there is executory. Executory means the parties have agreed, everybody signed, but we haven't yet gotten to that executed phase. We have, we're working toward an execute. And I'll give you my morbid way to remember this. If somebody is sentenced to death in the gas chamber in North Carolina, when they're sitting on death row, they ain't executed. They're executory, right? They're executed when the thing's done. That's my morbid tidbit for the night that has never failed me with the difference between executory and executed. So executed means closed. Executory means signed and agreed upon. The magic word when it comes to contracts. Enforceability enforceable. This is the only word that really matters in this chapter, to be honest with you. When you talk about contract law, the one word that matters is enforceable. Because the one place a contract really and truly matters is in a court of law. We don't sign contracts 
because we expect the general public to enforce a contract. We don't sign contracts because we expect real estate brokers to enforce contracts. We sign a contract, and let me go even one step further. We don't sign contracts because we think everything's going to go well in a transaction. Because folks, if everything goes well, do we need a contract? No. I, here's why I say that. If a buyer shows up with money at closing and a seller shows up with a deed, is anybody going to tell them they can't close? No. They're going to close. Whether they've got a valid contract or not. Whether they've got an enforceable contract or not. We don't sign contracts just because we can or because we like them or because we think things are going to go well. Why do we sign a contract? Because we think things might do what? Go badly. Go sideways. We think the proverbial crap may hit the fan at some point. And when and if it does, we want the ability to do what? Sue. Sue. We want the ability to go to court and say to a judge, we had an agreement and here is proof of that agreement. And we want that judge to look at that agreement and agree that this is proof that some promise was broken. Does that make sense? If I'm suing somebody in court over a contract, I'm presenting the contract and saying, here's what they promised to do, Your Honor. And the judge is being asked to look at that agreement and see if it really is what they say. Is that promise really there? And was that promise really broken? And if that promise was really broken, then that judge has the power to enforce that contract. Does everybody understand what that word enforceability means now? It's all related to court. It's, would a court of law step in and say, no, you have an agreement and you must follow that agreement. That's what enforceability means. And that's the magic word when it comes to contract law. Because ultimately, all we're ever trying to do with creating a contract is to create an enforceable agreement, an enforceable contract, one that if it ended up in court, a judge would say, this is a valid agreement. These parties made promises to each other, and they need to follow those promises. Make sense for everybody? Good, good. Validity of contracts. This is, again, some terminology that you need to be familiar with. A valid contract should always be your goal. A valid contract is one that is enforceable on both parties. In the buyer-seller sense, it's enforceable on the buyer. They need to bring money and pay for the property. It's enforceable on the seller. The seller needs to transfer title. A judge would look at that agreement and say, you promised to do this and you promised to do that. That's enforceable on both parties. That's what valid means. It means it meets all the requirements of the law and it's enforceable on both parties. A void contract is exactly the polar opposite of a valid contract. How many parties do you think it's enforceable on? None. None. And here's the reason. A void contract is not one that was created and then voided. That's not a void contract. A void contract is one that never was in the first place. One, it's an agreement between two parties, but for some reason, it was never legal in the first place. I said I was only going to give you one more good example, and I'll give you two. A drug deal is a void contract. But you would be surprised how many people will call the police because they didn't get their drugs for the money they paid. That would, that would blow my mind, right? Can you imagine going to court of law and saying, we had a deal. He agreed he was going to supply me an eight ball and I was going to pay him this amount of money for it, right? Oh we God. had a... Yeah, I just said that. You said eight ball, that's amazing. Isn't that? You'd think I'd have some experience. No, not at all. I'm not that fun, trust me. Um... <laughs> you don't get to be 300 pounds doing eight balls. I don't think that's, I think that's mutually exclusive thing. You know? um, so, but that's a deal. It's a contract. It's an agreement between two parties. But would a court of law enforce it? Would a court of law say, oh no, you agreed to pay him for that eight ball, so you must pay him for that? No. 
because it was for an illegal act in the first place. Does that make sense to everybody? That's a void contract. Now, don't confuse void with one that used to be valid but for some reason has been <coughs> terminated. No, void means it never was. It never got off the ground. It was never enforceable, ever. That's what void means. Good on that? A voidable contract is one in which only one party is bound. So valid is how many are bound? Two. 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 Both sides. Void is only one side is bound. Now that can happen in a couple different ways. It can be voidable from the, from the outset. Maybe something was wrong with one side of the deal from the outset and it's voidable. An example of that would be you don't have a legally competent party here. Um, Oh, sorry, I didn't mean get that. You don't have a legally competent party. We're going to talk about what legally competent is in a second, but one example of somebody who's not legally competent is a minor, a child. A child is not legally competent to enter into a contract. Now, that does not mean a child can't purchase real estate. Don't confuse those two things. Can a child enter into a contract to purchase real estate? Yes. Can a child close that transaction and purchase that real estate? Yes. yes. If the child decides they don't want to buy, can the adult who signed the contract, the seller, sue the child and say, you promised to buy this property? No. 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 Because the child is not a competent party. Does that make sense? So a contract from its very formation is what we call voidable because it's only enforceable on one party. Which one? The, the adult. The competent party. The adult in this example. The seller. That's exactly right. So how long does it, like if, you, if a minor buys a piece of real estate, how long do they have to say I changed my mind? Until closing. Okay. So once Until they've closed. Once they've closed, you're not going to rescind the deed. Okay. Because at that point the contract has been fully consummated. But they could walk up to the closing and go, you know, I, I, I was kidding. <laughs> and the seller would have no recourse whatsoever because they entered into that contract understanding that, or should they should have understood, that that party that they were agreeing with has no contractual capacity. They don't have legal competency. Yes, ma'am? If, um, if a void contract goes through, mm -hmm. is it still, like, it, would it still be they can always close. Okay. Don't confuse. So uh, if I get what you're asking, yeah. can a void contract be closed? Right. Yes. Okay, and so later no one can come back and say, oh, that was supposed to be my title? No. Okay. No. Void just means it would not be enforced in a court of law, okay. period. Neither party would ever be bound under that contract. But once we're closed, we're closed. Okay. All of these can be closed equally. And the truth is... Most real estate transactions never make it to the closing table with a valid contract. Because the other way you can have a voidable contract is when you start as valid, but one party screws up somewhere along the way. If one party screws up, aka breaches the contract, what do you think the other party has the right to do? Walk away. Walk away. So if one party has the right to walk away and one party's bound, what do we call that? Now, voidable. When one party's bound and one party has the right to just throw their hands up and say, I'm done, I'm out, that's a voidable contract. So I'll give you an example of what I mean, how that happens in a real estate transaction. We go under contract on a property, the buyer has an inspection done, they find several things that need to be corrected about the property, they ask the seller to make those corrections and the seller agrees. Okay, we're going to fix these ten things. They sign an agreement saying they're going to fix those ten things. Does that agreement become part of the contract now? Is that part of the promises that each party has made? Absolutely. On the day of closing, one of the promises was to replace the railing on the back deck of the house. Day of closing, the buyer goes to do a final walkthrough and they find that the railing has not been replaced. Now, we have a voidable contract because the seller has promised to do something and they did not do it. Does that make sense to everybody? But, just because it's voidable does not mean we're not going to close. Because here's the reality of that situation. Sure, the buyer can throw a hissy fit, stamp, I'm not buying this house, he didn't fix that rail. Where's their stuff? 
On the moving truck. On a moving truck. Right? Where are they going to live tonight if they don't close? In the moving truck. <laughs> do they really want to do that over a rail? You see what I'm saying? Do they have that legal right? Sure. You have a legal right to take a hammer and bash your own feet in. Do if you want to, but I don't think anybody wants to do it. At some point, you have to decide, you know, if the, the repercussions to you are worth exercising your contractual rights. So lots of times we have little small promises that are made by sellers or something's not done to a buyer's satisfaction or we didn't close by the closing date, but everybody just sort of agrees like, you know, if from the seller's perspective, if the buyer doesn't close on time, yeah, the seller can terminate and walk away, but what do they have to do? Start all over, Start all over again. Yeah, you can keep my $100 due diligence fee and my $500 earnest money deposit, but now I've got to start all over again and find another buyer. Or I could wait three extra days and let this one close. That's a voidable contract, right? Because the buyer didn't live up to their promises. But in the, sell in the seller's best interest is probably to do what? So let it close. Let it close. So does that sort of answer your question about yeah, all of these categories are closable? It's just about what the legal rights are as far as getting out of the contract. Because they're getting the deed and then that's right. It. Okay. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, again, if somebody shows up with money and somebody shows up with a deed, we're gonna have a closing. Okay. Don't get in the way of that. You're doing it wrong. If you stop a closing, remember you don't get paid till after it closes. I'm just to remind you of that little yes. fact, right? You start stopping closing, somebody's gonna look at you like you've lost your mind because you have. Right. And then the last one here is unenforceable. Unenforceable simply means it's not enforceable on either party. Okay? It's not enforceable on either party. That's different than void. Because void means it never was a contract in the first place. Unenforceable generally means it started as a legal agreement, but both parties have screwed up, both parties have breached, so neither party really has any rights under this contract anymore. Could they still close it? Absolutely. Any questions about the difference between valid, void, voidable, and unenforceable? Okay, make sure you make sure you can differentiate those because you probably will see that in a test question. <laughs> Essential elements of a valid contract. What do we need if we want the contract to be valid? As we said, we need legal capacity or competency of the parties. And there's two main things you need to be concerned with here. That they're not a minor, which in North Carolina is what age? 18. That is the uh, the minimum age for contract capacity in North Carolina, and that they are not intoxicated in any way, because an intoxicated person does not have the legal capacity to enter into a contract. You don't have to carry a breathalyzer around with you, you know. Um, but what I would say is, if you see your clients consuming alcohol in your presence and you're presenting them with an offer, you may wait and come back. You know, I, I don't think that's out of bounds necessarily. Or have, have them wait. Say, you know, guys, let's go over the offer first and then I'll have a drink with you. You know, type thing, you know. But you probably need to make sure as best you can that they're not, in, they're, they're not intoxicated because you don't want that claim to come up late. Okay? You need a mutual assent or meeting of the minds. Now, we're going to talk extensively about that in Chapter 10 when we get to sales contract practices and what constitutes a meeting of the mind. It needs to be for something legal and there needs to be some promise of exchange of money, consideration. Now, don't let that confuse you to say that there has to be things like earnest money or there have to be a due diligence fee. Does there have to be a due diligence fee in a transaction for it to be considered a legal transaction? No. No. Does there have to be an earnest money deposit? No. no. But I thought we have to have consideration. What's the consideration? What Sorry? The, the, the purchase price. That's exactly right. The consideration is at the heart of the transaction is the purchase price. It doesn't have to be money exchange. Brokers get confused about that. We don't have a contract because we haven't paid the due diligence fee yet. No, that has nothing to do with it. You do have a contract. Paying the due diligence fee doesn't have anything to do with it. Well, we haven't had consideration. Yes, you have. The promise of money paid is consideration. Does everybody understand the difference there? That you have to, it's not that money has to be exchanged, there has to be some promise of money to be exchanged. 
And you cannot have these things. No mistakes, no fraud or misrepresentation, no duress or undue influence. So let's talk about what duress is and what undue influence is. And these are very um, different forms of pressuring somebody into a contract. Duress is the threat of physical harm. If somebody is under duress, you are essentially threatening their body. You holding them hostage, you're starving them to death, you're doing something that threatens their physical well-being if, if they're under duress. Somebody who is suffering undue influence is basically under emotional stress. They're being emotionally stressed. So an example of undue influence might be a, a child telling their parent, you know, Mom, I know you don't want to sell the house, but uh, it's so far away from me, I really don't think I can come see you anymore if you stay in the house here. So I really, if I was you, I'd probably go ahead and sell it. That's an example of undue influence. And that could create a voidable contract because that person you know, signed that agreement under that pressure. You know? Now, I'll give you an example of duress from the same mother-son situation. Uh, you know, Mom, you need your medicine and you don't have your driver's license anymore. I don't know who's going to go pick it up for you if you don't sign it and sell this house because I don't think I'm going to come over anymore and go get your medicine for you if you don't sell the house. That would be duress because the threat of withholding something like food or medicine or something like that. Yes, sir. Oh, well, back to the like void and avoidable. Uh, if you're like intoxicated or under the influence, that contract is voidable. Is that correct? That is correct. But if you're deemed like I think we said in one class, if you're deemed legally incompetent before the contract even starts, like you uh, mentally, they a court has deemed that you're you know legally insane. Right. That's void straight up, right? It's just it's it, no, it's still voidable. It's so you still can still voidable. enter into a kind uh, into a. They, they, they cannot, it's voidable, but they cannot actually close. It's a voidable contract that cannot be closed. Because okay. somebody who's been adjudicated as being mentally incompetent can't actually take title of the property. Okay. And, and what's going to happen there is that's going to come up, and in, in, when they do the research on them, that, that adjudication is going to come up, but it's going to stop the transaction. Okay. So that's the only difference. They're still voidable, but it just can't close. It just can't. And that does happen from time to time. It actually happened, thank God not me, but um, in the office I was in in Chapel Hill when I first got my license, there was an older gentleman who came in the office one day and said he wanted to see a house on Franklin Street. And uh, one of the agents who was there took him and showed him the house. He walked in the door. You know, he said, oh, I love it. I, I want to buy it. And he wrote a cash offer full price for a million dollar house that day gave her a check for an earnest money deposit showed her a bank statement um, you know showing proof of funds and the next day his daughter showed up and had a picture and said you know I'm trying to figure out if my dad's been in here and somebody said yeah he was in here yesterday and he's, he's buying a house on Main Street she said well no he's not my dad has Alzheimer's and he was a, he was an investor uh, for years and uh, he got out of the house yesterday and I didn't realize he was gone and so he had come in there and, and she brought the power of attorney paperwork to show that he no longer had the mental, you know, the, the, the legal authority to make those decisions on his behalf. The checking account was closed, the, you know, it was just, it, and so they, basically the contract just went away because of that. So yeah, it does happen from time to time. Okay? Um, Get back to my slide here. Offer and acceptance. It says a contract is formed when we have communication of acceptance. Now that's not in your book right here in this section. That's going to be extensively talked about in chapter 10, this idea of communication of acceptance. But basically, I wanted to describe it for you here because we're talking about going under contract. So I want you to know the moment when we are under contract. Acceptance is when a contract is signed. The moment a contract is signed, we, can get, we consider that acceptance. <laughs> However, acceptance is not enough by itself to create a binding, valid, legal contract. You need communication of that acceptance. In other words, if I'm the seller and I get an offer from a buyer and I accept that offer, that means I've signed that offer. 
were still not under contract until I communicated back to the buyer that I have signed that offer. Does that make sense for everybody? It's the communication of my acceptance that actually creates a binding agreement. And here's the reason why. Here's the legal theory behind that. If I sign it and accept it, does the buyer know that we're under contract? No. No. And legally, we don't want anybody to be under a contract that they're not aware of. So the contract is not formed until we communicate that it's been signed back to the other side of the transaction. So for action, let's say the, you, you present a contract at 9 o'clock at night, the sellers decide to sign it at 10 o'clock at night, yep. they don't want to call you because it's late. At 8 o'clock in the morning, you get a fax or uh, email from the buyer saying, you know what, I changed my mind. It's still, even though he signed the contract at 10 o'clock last night, if you don't know that he signed it, it hasn't been communicated, it's not a contract. That is exactly right. Did everybody sort of hear her scenario there? She said, you know, the buyer makes an offer, it gets presented late at night, sellers think it over. 10 o'clock at night, they decide, finally, we're going to sign it. And so they sign it, but they don't want to bother me. They don't want to let me know that they've signed it. They don't want to contact the buyer and let them know that we'll do it in the morning, you know. <laughs> so they put it on the desk, and next thing, the following morning at 8 o'clock, I get a phone call from the buyer who says, I'd like to rescind my offer. Well, to my knowledge, it's still an offer. To the buyer's knowledge, it's still an offer, correct? Yeah. Only the seller knows that it's a contract. contract. And so the law says that's not a contract. So, but if they called you at 10 o'clock at night and said, I signed the offer, but you don't let the buyer know, is it a contract? Depends on what side of the transaction I'm on. Okay. Am I representing the buyer, the seller, or both? You're representing the seller. If I'm representing the seller, it's still not a contract. Okay. Because that communication has to go to the other side of the transaction. Okay. So okay. in this case, it would have to go to the buyer. Okay, so it's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, whatever, at night, and I sign it, and I send an email to my agent, and my agent sends it to the buyer's agent. But say at 9 o'clock in the morning, they haven't read their email, and they want to rescind their offer, they can't because it was written Correct. and sent and timed. Correct. Okay. It's communicated. It's not that it's actually been read. It's that it's been communicated to the other side. Did everybody hear that question? So it doesn't matter if it's in your email and you haven't read it. It doesn't matter. As long as that communication has happened from one side of the transaction to the other. So basically, whoever signs it last, whether that be the buyer or the seller, whoever signs it last, has the duty to communicate to the other side of the transaction that it's been accepted. And it's at that moment that we form a contract. So, you know, I just I always use this, this sort of, you know, funny story, and it's not a real story, it's just a, a, a hypothetical. If I'm the listing broker, and we've got an offer in on a property, and my sellers have accepted that offer, they've signed it, and I'm in there scanning it so I can email it over to the buyer's agent and my phone rings while I'm scanning it and it's the buyer's agent. How am I going to answer that call? We got our contract signed. We've accepted your offer. <laughs> hey, how are you? What can I do for you? Because what might they be calling to do? <laughs> to, rescind. to rescind their offer. <laughs> and, and the status of that contract is literally going to be dictated by who communicates first. If I communicate that we've got a contract, do we have a contract? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> and that would be very important for protecting my client because what's due at contract formation that you had a homework assignment about the other day? The money. The due diligence fee. So whatever due diligence, so if that buyer's calling to say they've rescinded their offer and I get out first when my clients have accepted your <laughs> offer, is the due diligence fee now owed to my clients? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. That's a good thing to know. Yeah. <laughs> and so this last point down here, offers can always be rescinded at any time prior to communication and acceptance, which is exactly what we were just talking about right there. It's not the acceptance that matters. It's the communication of that acceptance. So any time prior to communication of acceptance, an offer can be rescinded. Here's how they love to talk you out of that on a test. Quinn makes an offer on a property on Monday afternoon with the condition that the offer will be valid till 5 p.m. on Friday afternoon. On Wednesday at 2 p.m., Quinn contacts her broker to inform them that she is taking her offer off the table. 
on Thursday at 2 p.m., the seller signs and accepts Quinn's offer and communicates that acceptance back to Quinn. What is the legal status of this contract? There's not one because she took her offer back. What did they try to talk you out of there? She said her offer was valid until Friday at 5 p.m. Can she change her mind about that? Absolutely. She can rescind her offer anytime prior to communication of acceptance. Everybody all right on that? That would be one I would read two or three times. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, and you do have to read through these. And don't let them talk you out of your gut instinct on these tests. That's, that's what they try to do. They're so evil. They actually write the test with, a, with an answer choice called the distractor. That when they write the question, the first answer they come up with is the distractor. The definition that they use of the distractor is an answer choice that 50% of test takers will view as the correct answer. Isn't that horrible? That they specifically create an answer choice that is so close to the answer that, that you think it's right. And then they create the correct answer. They create the correct answer after they create the wrong answer that you think is the correct answer. So, yeah, you have to be real careful. Hang on, let me get her. Okay. Let me, that applies to both parties. I'm sorry? The, um, the thing about them being able to take back, it applies to both parties? I, I, I missed that last part. They can both reject it before the communication of acceptance, both parties. Yes, sure, sure. They get, they, both parties have the opportunity to reject or counter offer or rescind their offer at any time prior to communication of acceptance. So the scenario you just gave with Quinn. Mm -hmm. um, she called her broker and said, you know what, I changed my mind, take it off the table. But the broker hasn't contacted the selling agent. Is it still rescinded? If yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, it, is uh, it is rescinded. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry. I, I may tune back into what you said. Let me repeat what you said first and make, and make sure I got it right. Okay. So Quinn has a broker, right. right? And she's contacted her broker and said, I want my offer taken off the table. Right. Her broker has not contacted the other side yes. and rescinded that offer. But in the meantime, it's signed. In the meantime, it's signed. It's, it remains an offer until communication of acceptance happens or until rescission happens from one side to the other. It has to go from one side to the other. So. The seller can still sign and accept it, and they can still communicate acceptance until Quinn's broker contacts the other side and pulls that offer off the table. So if, if they haven't, so so the broker, so the other side signs the offer, yep. and they call her broker and say, we've signed and accepted this offer before he tells them it's been rescinded. Is it a contract? Yes. Okay. It is. It is. Because that communication, whether it's to rescind the offer or to communicate acceptance, always has to cross that divider between the buyer and the seller. So if that were the test question, if, you know, they haven't, you know, you say you know, she rescinded the offer and told her broker and then the offer's accepted, well, if they don't know the offer has been rescinded, before they can accept it. Right. And then it's still a valid contract. Because the communication of acceptance happened before the rescission happened. See, that what, they're, what you're tripping yourself up mentally there is the offer never was rescinded. <laughs> Because Quinn telling her broker that she's rescinding the offer is the same thing as her telling herself she's rescinding the offer. Because they're on the same side. That rescission, that I'm taking my offer off the table, has to come from over here to over here. Just so, like communication and acceptance. So if that were a test question, it would be a, a valid contract. A valid contract. Okay. That's exactly right. Everybody understand her question. She said, Quinn buyer in the house, she's got a broker. She makes an offer. She changes her mind. Calls her broker and says, I want you to pull my offer off the table. Broker forgets. They're busy. They, you know, they mean to write an email. They never do write an email. Two hours later, the seller signs and accepts that offer. The listing agent contacts Quinn's agent and says, we're under contract. The question is, are we under contract? What, and what is the answer? Yes. yes, we are, because Quinn's offer being taken off the table never made it away from the buyer side. It's that information sat there stewing on the buyer side and never made it to the other side of the transaction. Is the broker responsible for that? Yeah, absolutely. You better believe it. Okay. Somebody's getting sued there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because Quinn legally owes that due diligence fee now. She owes it to the seller, but who's she going to go after for it? Her broker. Because she owes it because the broker was negligent in their duties. The best thing that broker could do in that situation 
Because remember, when it's a due diligence contract, right? The buyer has the right to terminate for any reason or no reason. The best thing a broker who was in Quinn's broker situation can do right there is get out their checkbook and write out the due diligence fee check to the seller and then say, we terminate. You, know, you hand them the check. That's the best thing you can do if you're the broker. And that's it. Don't even tell Quinn that she owes the money. Just be like, listen, this is my fault. I screwed it up. I'm going to fix it. Don't worry about it. And go pay them the due diligence fee and hand them the written termination at the same time. It's the best thing you could do if you, if you made that mistake. Because clearly it's the broker's fault. Okay. For sales contracts in North Carolina, they always must be in writing. We need to talk about a law called the Statute of Frauds. And we've mentioned it once, but here it gives you more detail. The North Carolina Statute of Frauds is a law that says certain agreements must be in writing. Certain agreements have to be in writing in order for a court to enforce them. If they're not in writing, no court in North Carolina will even consider them if they're on this list. It's basically a list of documents and it says these documents for a court to even hear a case relating to them must be in writing. And one of those documents is a real estate sales contract. So if, if a buyer and seller have an oral agreement to sell real estate, can they close that? No. Yes, but, oh, they no, they binding. but they can't, it's not binding, they can't enforce it. You see the difference yes. there? I can go and make a deal, you know, with Isaiah to buy his house and say, look, I'll pay you $150,000 for your house, show up next week at my closing attorney's <laughs> office and bring your deed with you. If he shows up with a deed and I show up with $150,000, we're going to have closing, folks. That's an oral contract. But if I don't show up with the money, can he sue me and say we had an oral agreement for him to buy my house? No, he can't because the statute of frauds says that real estate sales contracts must be in writing to be enforceable. And there are other things that are covered under the statute of frauds, but that's a big one for us is real estate sales contracts. Notably, leases are not covered under the statute of fraud. So what does that mean? We can have what kind of leases? An oral lease. Oral, oral leases can agree. be enforceable unless they're for longer than three years. If they're for longer than three years and you want them to be enforceable, they got to be in writing. And then the other, the other law that we talk about here is the parole evidence rule. And this is a very simple concept with a fancy name. You can only change a written agreement with more writing. You can't have an oral change to a written agreement because written always trumps oral. That's just the way it works. If you have a written agreement, and, and this happens a lot in real estate transactions, you know, um, you go under contract, you have a written contract, and you agree two weeks later to reduce the purchase price because you found a bunch of repairs that need to be done to the property, and the seller doesn't want to make the repairs. And so you have this conversation, okay, well, we'll reduce the purchase price by $2,000. What should you do with that change? Put it, right. put it in writing. Because if you don't put it in writing, is any court going to enforce that change? No. no. The parole evidence rule says you can only change written agreements with more writing. All right. Some other phrases or concepts you might see in a contract. The phrase time being of the essence. If you noticed, um, when you had the homework about the offer to purchase and contract, and I asked you about the due diligence date, if you go back and look at that due diligence date, it has that phrase behind it in the contract, in bold, right? It's in bold writing. It says, the expiration of the due diligence period will be at 5 p.m. on, and there's a blank, and then right behind that blank it says, time being of the essence. So here's what that phrase means. Time being of the essence means this is not a suggestion. This is a firm deadline. That one minute past 5 p.m. on that day and you're in breach of this contract. Okay? Your due diligence ends exactly at 5 p.m. on that day. So anything that says time being of the essence means it is a firm deadline. Now one thing you'll notice about that standard offer to purchase and contract, the one we use, one particular date that does not say time is of the essence. You want to take a guess at it? What's the other major date in the contract? Closing date. Does not say time is of the essence. So what do you think the closing date is? It's a target. It's a 
target. You're not necessarily breaching the contract if you miss that closing date. It's understood. Matter of fact, this specific contract that we have goes on to say that either party gets 14 days after the scheduled closing date as long as they're trying to close. You're not actually in breach of the contract until you've gone 14 days past the scheduled closing date. It's a pretty long uh, uh, grace period, I would say. Right. A novation, the, the prefix nova means new. So a novation is a new contract to replace an old contract. Basically, we do a novation when there are so many things that need to be changed about a contract, it just makes more sense to go with a new contract. So I'll give you an example of how that might happen. We go under contract on a property, and we end up doing inspections, and we find that lots of repairs need to be made. The seller's going to make some of the repairs, but it's going to take them a long time to make the repairs, and they're not going to be finished by the closing date. Some of the other repairs are not going to make, and they're going to give us a credit toward closing costs for those repairs. And we're also going to reduce the purchase price because the property didn't appraise for the purchase price. So what are we changing here? We're changing the closing date. We're changing the purchase price. We're changing the seller paid closing costs. That's a lot of things to change about one agreement. Would you, would you agree with that? So what we are likely to do in that case is just regenerate a brand new, clean, contract. What kind of contract is it? A brand new clean contract to replace the old one. That's a novation. That's when you just basically say our agreement has so substantially changed that rather than make all these individual changes, we're just going to take a new agreement and replace the old one with the new. That's a novation. And so it makes the other one void. It makes the other one, it, the other one vanish. It's gone. It's not void, but it's just not there anymore. So, but the other one's still in force until the new one's signed by both parties. Correct. That's exactly right. Until the new one replaces it, which is signed by both parties, the other one's still in force. Absolutely. Okay? An assignment is different than a novation. In an assignment, the contract itself is not changing. The parties on the contract are changing. An assignment takes somebody's name off of the contract and puts somebody else's name on the contract. So I'll give you an example of how that might happen in today's real estate market. We, we talked about how crazy the real estate market is right now, right? So let's say that Tamara is looking at buying a property and she goes under contract after a big bidding war for $300,000 on this property. Leanne was the other offer or who was pushing that price. And when she made her best offer, she offered two ninety eight, dollars and she didn't get it. Now, ever since that happened, she's been sick. She can't sleep. She can't eat. Because she's like, you know, I know I should have paid $310,000 for that house. She's just out of her mind crazy. She could legally approach Tamara and say, I'll pay you $10,000 cash right now to take your name off of that contract and put my name on it. That's an assignment of the contract. Now, I didn't say they automatically had permission from the seller to do that, and they need permission from the seller to do that. But it's legally possible to do so as long as you have the seller's permission or the other party's permission. Does everybody understand the difference between a novation and an uh, assignment? In a novation, the terms of the contract are being replaced. In an assignment, it, in a novation, the, the contract's being replaced, but the parties stay the same, right? In an assignment, the contract's staying the same, but the parties are changing. Make sense? Good. Good. And there are actually there are actually people out there right now in this market who are I call them vultures that are taking advantage of the current market. They'll go to they watch like for example the obituaries and 
the estate hearings and things like that. And they'll go to people who've recently inherited property, knowing that they may not have an idea of how hot a market is in a particular area or what's going on in a particular area. And they'll write a contract with that person to purchase their property, but they don't use the standard offer to purchase in contract. They use one that has language inserted in it that gives them the right to freely assign that contract to anybody without the seller's permission. And they'll do it with a long closing period of like 180 days. You know, we're going to close in 180 days. And guess what they do in the meantime during that 180 days? They actively market the property to other buyers in the hopes that they will find a buyer that will pay more than what they're paying to the seller and what they will do when they find that. So let's say they're agreed to pay the seller $100,000, right? And now they've found Karen who's willing to buy the property for $125,000. They will assign that contract over to Karen and they, Karen will pay them the $25,000 difference between the two. It's an assignment. It's completely legal. I still call them vultures, but you know. It is entirely a legal process. So that, uh, that's kind of like people who like will buy any house and they come in with an investor. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly right. Because their whole intention is to resell it to somebody else before they ever even take title. They don't intend to actually buy the house. They intend to write a contract saying they buy the house, but they intend to find another buyer to actually complete that contract. And they do an assignment to take themselves off and put the new buyer on. Okay. Okay. How do we discharge a contract? In other words, get rid of one. How do we make them go away? Well, the best way to make a contract to go away is full performance. Full performance is the best way for a contract to go away. That means all the promises have been fulfilled. We could also have a partial performance or a substantial performance. Both of those are the parties have done some portion, usually most of what they've promised to do. Okay. Um, Sometimes we have an impossibility of performance, which means that one of the two parties just can't close. An example of that might be a buyer who cannot get a loan. That's an impossibility of performance. Now, would they still lose their earnest money deposit? Sure they would. But you can't also go sue them for a contract that they cannot possibly close. A seller who was foreclosed on, that's an impossibility of performance. They cannot sell you what they don't own any longer. So that's going to discharge that contract. doesn't mean you may not have some liability there, but the contract itself goes away because of the, the impossibility of performance. You could always have a mutual agreement. The two parties just agree, look, we don't want to be under a contract anymore. I'll let you go. You let me go. And then an operation of law. Courts of law can always declare any contract to be discharged if they want to. So let's talk about remedies. And that's a word you should be familiar with. You should probably star, star that word because it's definitely one you're going to see um, in a test scenario. A remedy is the same thing as damages. Okay? Remedies are monies that are paid to one party when the other party breaches the contract. <laughs> The remedy for breaching a contract is usually some type of damages that you are either paid or awarded by a court of law. When we talk about suing somebody, what we're really looking for is some remedy. Does that make sense for everybody? So if you see that phrasing on a test, don't be confused by that. They're just talking about damages. What happens when somebody breaches a contract? Like, for example, we talked about the offer to purchase, 2T contract. Is there a remedy built into that contract for a buyer who breaches the contract? Well, before you answer that, let's talk about what does it mean for a buyer to breach that 2T offer to purchase and contract? What's happened? The buyer didn't what? Didn't close after what date? The due diligence date. That's the only way the buyer can breach that contract. Is everybody clear on that? The only possible breach from the buyer's perspective of that contract is we're past the due diligence date and they don't close. Because if they don't close before the due diligence date, they can just what? Walk away and terminate. They can't just walk away and terminate after the due diligence date without being in breach. 
Does the contract specify the remedy that the seller has if the buyer breaches that contract? Yes. What is that remedy? You get, you get the, the earnest money deposit. You get the earnest money deposit. The earnest money is going to be forfeited. And to give you more detail, it says it will be forfeited as liquidated damages. That's what that contract says. Here's a definition of liquidated damages, and you should be as most familiar, if you want to start something on this slide, it would be liquidated damages, because it's the ones that we use most often in residential transactions. Liquidated damages are ones that are agreed on in advance. You don't need to sue to get this money. You're not going to court and saying, please give me some money, I would like this much. There's no need to go to court. You both agreed in advance that if the buyer breaches the contract, this is how much money the seller is going to get. And they can't sue for more. And they cannot sue for more. It's been agreed upon in advance. That's what liquidated damages means. Everybody clear on that one? Now, the other two types of damages are compensatory damages or consequential damages. You don't really need to know much about them other than you have to sue to get both of those because they're not specified in the contract. Now, if the seller breaches the 2T contract, there is no remedy in that contract for a seller breach. What it simply says is that if the seller breaches, the buyer has the right to sue them for a bunch of stuff. Right? There's no specific amount of money that the buyer is going to get if the seller breaches that contract. So we don't have liquidated damages from both perspectives. We only have liquidated damages from the buyer's perspective. From the seller's perspective, it's going to be uh, more along the lines of compensatory damages, where you're going to sue for the actual money you lost as the buyer because the seller breached that contract. And then down here at the bottom, a lawsuit for specific performance. Specific performance means you're suing and asking a court of law to force somebody to do what they promised they would do. In a real estate transaction, that refers to one possible lawsuit. It's a buyer suing a seller to force them to sell. Seller has changed their mind. They don't want to sell the property. The buyer still wants the property. And so the buyer sues the seller and says, I want the property. You promised to sell me the property. Here's your money. Take it and shut up. Go away. This happens fairly often. Not terribly often, but it's fairly often. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Um, a couple years ago now, down at the coast, older gentleman placed a beachfront house on the market, went under contract, passed away before closing. His daughters did not want to sell the property. They were adamantly against selling the property. They refused to sign the deed. And the buyer sued the two daughters for specific performance. And the court ruled in the favor of the buyer because the contract survived the death of the owner. And it was clear that the owner's wishes were to sell to this person. The buyer sued for specific performance. And they were awarded the property at the original terms of the contract. So it's always a buyer suing a seller. It doesn't work the other way around. Sellers sue buyers for money, not for specific performance. Buyers sue sellers for specific performance. Okay? Make sure you know that distinction. We've already talked about this. Our authority to prepare documents, fill in the blanks. That's what your authority is. Fill in the blanks and only fill in the blanks. You're not authorized to draft contract language for anybody. If your clients need language drafted, what are their two options? Do it themselves or hire an attorney. Do it themselves or get an attorney to do it for them. Having us do it for them is not an option. And the do it themselves option should come with a warning of you really don't know what the legal impact of this language is going to be, so that's very dangerous to do. I wouldn't just let them willy-nilly start writing stuff. I would say, I would not do that, and I would not recommend you do that. You can legally do it, but I don't recommend it. All right? We can only use pre-printed forms and fill them in as long as those forms contain what the NCREC, the North Carolina Real Estate Commission, says they should be. That's it for Chapter 8.